So just a, a brief bio on the people who are going to give a, the talks today. Mike Holloway is a senior data scientist based at UKCH Lancaster, and he's focused on leading and contributing to the development and application of novel data science methods. The different challenges faced in the environmental sciences uh, using virtual research labs, i.e. data labs. Um, <clears throat> Michael Zoll is a data scientist at UKCH, also based at Lancaster, and he fo he's focusing on advancing and demonstrating the use and capability of data science methods for a wide range of environmental applications, including the application of novel machine learning and statistical methods. And finally, Tom, Tom August is a computational ecologist, who works down at, at our Wallingford office, and he focuses on bridging the gap between research scientists and information technology experts. And Tom works in the Biological Record Center, uh, the B, uh, BRC, and he works with statistical experts to develop methods for analyzing species occurrence data and works to make these methods available to other academics uh, and researchers. So, uh, with all that out of the way, let's make a start to the uh, webinar. Mike H, or Mike Holloway, is going to lead off, and he's a brave man because he's going to be doing a live demo to start off with. So, over to you, please, Mike. Morning, everyone. Yeah, so like Mike said, I'm going to be um, quite brave today to try and, and show you the Data Labs project live and show you how it was um, used to do a, a scientific challenge within um, a project that I'm, I'm heavily involved with, um, joint with Lancaster University. So just to put a bit of context, the project um, we're working on is called Data Science of the Natural Environment, and it's pretty much what it says on the tin. So the idea is to bring com computational scientists, environmental scientists, data scientists, and um, yeah, statisticians together to try and answer, bring, you know, bring a new way of looking at environmental data, because often people just resort to the same sort of method, like mean, um, fitting a regression model. So we want to sort of see if we can use new methods. So in this particular case, we were challenged with coming up with a new way of um, uh, evaluating a numerical model, aside from just comparing some time series and looking at the mean, or something like that, and how well it performed. So, like I said, um, like Mike said in the introduction, the data lab that you thought was a great thing here because we thought it can break down the barriers of collaborative working, you know, sharing code, sharing data, ensuring everyone works from a consistent version of data. So here we are with the data lab. So when you log in, like, like we said, it uses the power of the cloud. It's hosted on Jasmine. So all you need to access, you don't need any special com computational skills. You don't need any like that you just need a web browser so you come into this web browser here and you see an information page i did actually just update this information two minutes ago but it doesn't seem to have come through to explain what disney means like i said data science and natural environment so you come into this area and this is something everyone on your project can see and share so first and foremost we have some data i'm not going to go into the details so you can refer to the pre previous seminar or webinar where you go into the detail of this aspect system but we do have a storage volume here where everyone's data is stored um, everyone works in the same version of the data, and this is where sort of our small level data, model data is stored. One thing I will say is Lancaster University had some data that was stored on their system here. So we actually used um, a mirror and we used API access to the thread server to read that data directly off. So whenever Lancaster University updated their data, it fed straight back into the data lab's environment. So first and foremost, I'm actually going to go through a notebook. And for those of you, most people probably have used Jupyter Notebooks before, but that's the sort of um, the backbone of the collaborative aspect of Data Labs is using these great um, environments to work together on a particular um, analytics piece of code. So like Mike said, we have Jupyter and we have RStudio. So I'm going to show you one that I've preloaded. So you come into this environment here and you have a notebook, nice up so you, and explaining what's going on. And it has a nice combination of code, data sets, and also a list of all the files that you've got working in the environment here. And the other thing to show is, um, wrong button, but when people are sharing code and data, you often have to get the environment working on your own system. You have to sometimes share the data. Like I said already, we've catered for that in this um, project. We've got the numerical model data sitting at Lancaster University, which we're reading into the labs. And we've also got the um, uh, observational data we're comparing our model to sitting here live in the data labs. So again, everyone's working off, off the same version. The code is linked through the, the notebook through Git. So you can attach to a Git repo here. This one particular one isn't 
because it's a demo notebook, but the actual notebook normally is linked um, through to, um, to Git, so everyone's working from the same version of the code, and although everyone can edit the code as well, and also it's version control, so it's backed up. But more importantly, we have the, we utilize a nice thing called Conda environment. I'm not going to go into the technical details, but basically it, it's a package management software so that everyone has the same environment available off, off the bat. You don't have to um, install a load of software to get the code working. This code will work working for me if I was to share it with you or my colleagues at Lancaster straight away. They would have access to the same code and it would run. If it broke for them, it would be broken for me. So that's a bit of a catch-22 in the sense that if something breaks, you've broken it for everyone. But at the same time, it's a good way of me. You'd have to spend ages getting um, things set up you've got the data there, you've got the notebook there to tell you what's going on, and you've also got the environment so you have to set that up. So you can concentrate on the science. So speaking of the science, let's show you actually how we used the data labs to do, do the science in this particular case. So as you see here, we've got a notebook environment up and running, and it's a combination of code and text to explain what's going on. And also we have this thing up here, this is the kernel, so this is to ensure you're working off the same software environment. So to put into a little bit of context what we were actually doing um, for this particular project is we were using a method um, called change point detection to, to see how well um, our regional climate models in this case with um, capturing the dynamic scene and weather station data. Now normally like I said people will look at global statistics across the time series and I will actually scroll down quickly to show you sort of something an example of what I mean. So you have a time series here and people if they were evaluating their model or their um, uh, data side by side, you would look across this entire uh, mean or variance across the entire thing and see how well it compares. What about these local scale events, say these peaks and troughs, how well do they capture? So this is where we use change point detection because that looks for these changes. So in the notebook, we just load up the packages. So for people who know R, it tells you what packages you'll be using in your environment. So other people can come along and um, understand what sort of software environment you've used. Then some warning messages or package loading messages to tell you what's going on with the an analysis. And then you come into the section of the code where you read in, um, read in your observational data. So like I said, this is located locally on the system. So you read it in from the file store and then you can sort of plot up a map to see, um, sort of visualize the data. Now what you can do here is you could bring in another expert. They could sort of say, well, actually, maybe you want to look at another station so they could have a more better knowledge of the um of the greenland ice sheet in this case so they can actually bring in their data set and add that to your data set on the map and what you can do with the notebook section of the code is you could actually edit this particular code so as you can see it's a completely live coding environment they could edit this code cell here to bring in their data set as well uh, if they've got something extra or something they want to share with you and say oh collaborate on this and then you can automatically view their side by side with yours on this map so you can sort of see what's going on. Then you extract the model data. This is read in, read in from um, Lancaster University through a thread server. So that's actually, I've loaded it from an R data frame here, but actually it's being directly read um, from the, the university side. So like I said, if they were to update their data at that size, this would be able to pick it up and pick up the new data. And then you can see, again, you can visualize the data and you can critique it together to understand what's going on. And finally, you can then plot the two time series side by side, which is what this code is doing, and you can visualize it and see that um, how your model and your observations compare. So by eye, they look pretty good. So finally, I'm not going to go into the detail of the change point analysis. I think Michael touched on some change point things in his talk, so I will leave it. As, like I said, we detect the change points in the time series and we see how well they compare to each other. So as you can see from this rather busy plot here, the dashed lines are the model change points, the um, you, um, blue line, sorry, the dashed um, red line, or the, the horizontal, vertical, get the words right a second, are the obs. And you can see that some cases you've got an observed change point, the model hasn't picked it up. In other cases, you can see they're slightly missed. So we came up with a new method that used um, overlap of confidence intervals to see how well it captured and it gave a score out of one basically it's closer to one the better the model evaluated so that's essentially what this table down here is showing in a second but you can also like i said focusing on specific events and localize if you've got an event you're particularly interested in say your environmental scientist looks at this time series here with you and says oh i want to focus on a specific event let's code that up now and see what we can see you can edit the date range here and then you can look at that live so you could change a particular date range here and focus on a specific year um that works quite well so you can say well 
you can you can work together live to, to edit and say you know focus on specific events and then finally this large ream of code here is actually producing the analytical method you can get to the bottom and you can look at the overlap of confidence intervals let's say it's a lot of code here so i'm not going to get into all the detail because it's too much actually there's no table there somewhere there should be a table that gives you the scores of each um uh of overlap of confidence, and like I said, closer to one, better evaluation. Now, like I said, here, if this method wants to be used with something else, you can take the code notebook, you can bring in your own data set, and you can apply the method to that. Or if another scientist comes along and says, actually, have you thought about trying extreme value theory here to coincide with your change points to look at that? What about if we try running that? They could, you could get that expert, they could come in, they could add the code to your particular notebook, or they could run their script and bring it into your notebook and you can do the two methods side by side and then look um, at how different methods compare at evaluating different localized events so it's quite handy to um, bring everything together and explain what's going on at the same time with the description of the code and the data sets but also we appreciate that not everyone's a coder not everyone um, wants to um, uh, look at reams and reams of code. They want to explore the method, understand what's going on, but not exactly um, uh, see reams of code. So one thing we can do is also use things like R Shiny panel, which is a R Shiny equivalent for um, a dashboard equivalent for Python is coming to data labs, but the feet functionality is not quite there yet. And so what you can do is this is also public facing. So you could put the URL in now and run this app. It's the same um, method that I've just described in code except it's through a nice graphical user interface. And this is for sharing, like I say, if you've got an environmental expert that isn't a coder, but can bring a lot of valuable expertise to the analysis, and you want them to explore using the method and then give you an environmental angle because all you're looking at is the statistical side of things, they can use this app to go through the method, execute it, and give you some insight on things you might want to focus in on or things they want, you to, uh, they want to look at themselves. And like I said, it's using the same code base because it's all in the same environment. So I'll just quickly run the one site. No, uh, blow that down so you could take a while. So you can see it's executing that code I just showed you live in the background. You run through it and then it could print out some analytics at the end for you. So you can see your map there. You've got um, locations, different sites. You can run your method, look at your localized change points, look at your um, evaluation, and then also get a summary of the scores and the evaluation statistics for that particular model versus the observation data set. If they want to focus on a different site, rather than have to edit the code to do that, they can just pick a new site from the drop down menu. So we'll get with that one, um, extract the data again, that's bringing it in from the local store or the um, remote store, analyze and run like that. And as you can see, it's running away in the background and then in a second it will produce a new time series. So this would enable us to um, share with our environmental expert on the project and they looked at it and said, oh, actually 2012 seems to be an important year. How well does the model perform in 2012? So you just zoom out and you just focus on the year 2012, January, zoom in and so you can, you can zoom in on the particular year and actually focus on particular events and see how well the model goes. And that is a great way of breaking down the barriers to um, getting complex data science methods to an environmental challenge. And the final thing to say is if you've got a big data set you want to work with, you can utilize the power of the cloud. Like Mike said, we've got AM, not HPC options, but um, Dask and Spark, which are native to R and Python, which allow you to do highly parallelized data sets. So if you've got a large, like millions of points, you can parallelize your method to execute this and speed everything up. And I think what I'll do now is stop there and then hand over to Michael to, um, uh, um, go into some more actual scientific and some projects he's been working on. That's okay. Thanks, Mike. How, how do I stop sharing? Oh, there you go. There you go. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Everyone, I'm Michael Sill from um, UKC. I work heavily with the Data Labs um, platform. Um, and today I'm just going to show you one of the um, example use cases for uh, using Data Labs, um, which is the UK 
Inflammatory Change Network, ECN. Mm. Right, so I will talk about what ECN is, and then I'll go into um, three example challenges and how data labs can help um, tackle these challenges. Um, and then um, I will present also a little bit of research finding um, by the end of it. So, um, what is EPN? So, EPN is a network of 12 sites uh, across the UK that collect long term, called the whole, whole system approach um, to integrate data and models uh, for various subsystems um, for certain ecology. Um, so, um, it collects everything from physical, chemical to biological driver and response variables. Um, however, it is quite difficult to um, take full advantage of this whole system approach because often um, it requires um, certain uh, methodological, cultural and infrastructure shift to in order to facilitate uh, this kind of collaboration. Um, so I'm gonna present some of the progress we have using data labs to play in the past year, um, how we can tackle some of this challenge and I'll summarize them um, at the very end. So the First example I'm going to show is um, one of using um, third party data. So we're trying to understand um, what affects um, the ECN rainfall chemistry. Um, so even though ECN collects um, a wide variety of data, um, it's only doing so at the site. So we have to bring in lots of um, other third party data sets. And it's often difficult to do um, if individual researchers are just doing it on their own on the local machine. Um, there'll be a lot of um, copying and sending files around. But with data labs, we can bring in um, all the third party data in the same data store and everybody can analyze the data together. Um, so we are bringing um, the land weather classification data um, and also um, the error five and um, the global weather uh, reanalysis data to facilitate um, the mass and mass trajectory analysis. And all this is done on data labs and so that everybody can look at the same um, data together. Yeah, so that's our solution. And we um, found data from, from the service to data labs directly. Um, and then we also so produce our markdown reports and notebooks so that um, everybody um, can understand um, what exactly is analysis and have a better narrative of what's being done. Um, and then we can also help the discussion going on um, to understand the data a little bit better. And this is uh, some of the results we've got by the end of the project. Um, we have found that the lamb weatherly or cyclones frequency has a negative correlation with pollutant concentrations, um, but this effect is not um, as conclusive um, for the convective rainfall. Um, and there are other things that we will be, be continuing to look at, such as um, the frequency of sampling um, or how, how we can be more adapt adaptive in the way that we sample um, throughout the network. Um, but this, this is a good example of um, how to add value to the ECN data, um, where um, it may not show very much by itself, but as we bring in more third party data, um, we have a better contextual understanding of what the data is telling us, and it presents a more complete story um, in our study. And one thing we want to try to do um, in the data lab project is also to how to, to help um, lower the barrier entry to um, adopt some of the methods, how we share methods more readily with others. So one way we have tried is to um, convert on some of our research notebooks um, into this kind of a um, live document um, or kind of app type um, boxes, code boxes that people can run themselves to generate um, the same figures. Um, that you've seen in the paper. So this, this is a screenshot of um, the kind of app um, that we have. So 
we it's a no, it, it's it's a notebook by itself, but we just turn some of the the cells into a box where users can just come in to um, edit. So it's a very nice way to let users kind of customize um, the output they want to see, um, maybe test their own um, alternative hypothesis, or um, or just um, have a easy easier way to to learn a new method to adopt it to their own research. Um, and we have submitted this work for uh, publication recently. Right. So the second example I'm going to talk about um, is uh, one of methodological development. So Mike has already mentioned um, change point methods. So the change point is um, a location and time series where the statistics before and after are different. So um, there are statistic methods to detect it, but um, the ones that are used um, traditionally has not been very useful for environmental science because um, sometimes we, especially for manual sampling, we don't um, sample at um, very regular intervals, or we try to use um, data with very different sampling rates. So we need a basically we need a method that suits our environmental science needs. So um, using data labs, we collaborate um, to, with um, statisticians to develop a new mixed sampling rate change point method. Um, so it would would we'll, we'll relax the uh, assumption that all the all the um, all the free, all the time series have the same frequency, and um, it's re it's really nice um, to be able to use to have to do that. Um, as we have this project uh, during um, the pandemic and we couldn't meet, but uh, using the data labs platform, we can have online workshops together. Um, we can actually sit down and look at the data together. Uh, we can uh, make life changes to the notebooks on data labs is, that is actually working for environment data um, and, and the statisticians can, can understand our requirements better. So yeah, it's a really powerful way um, um, to work together um, and de demonstrate the use of data labs um, for the collaborative aspect of it. And fi finally, the third example I, I'll just touch on briefly um, is how to bring in kind of generic um, data science methods for um, uh, environmental um, use. So um, we, I said, DCN has a variety variety of data. Um, there are different needs, and um, sometimes it's very hard to uh, do quality um, assurance. So how can we do better than what we have been doing now? For example, how can we do better just, just um, by doing a simple rain check? So um, an idea from data science is that we um, use a clustering method. So we develop this idea to um, tag the state of, a, of, the sys, of the system, and then we do a check around that state. So um, like you see here, we, we use some um, meteorological variables to classify what state um, a site is in on a day. And then we use this state in turn of some kind of prediction intervals to uh, the data. So here's an example of moth counts. So, so um, basically what that would allow us to do is we have a different um, expected um, val value and prediction interval for the different um, states, and that would give us a more nuanced way to um, apply this type of um, quality checks to our data. So, it's, it's so th this is a, a much um, straightforward way than if we're going back to um, develop a quality um, assurance method for each of the different ecological data that we are collecting um, DCN. So uh, to conclude, I have uh, this um, quite busy summary slide um, um, on some of the um, challenges in, I've touched on earlier. Um, some, some of the details I, I didn't have time to go through, but, but you can see that um, the devs can help with a lot of the, the challenges that we often find in environmental science. Not the challenges are not just uh, scientific ones, it also, it also about the culture 
of which we collaborate. And some of them are actually more of a computing software or infrastructure challenge, but data labs can um, contribute to um, help solve some of these challenges um, and, and it would, would help us collaborate better. Um, and um, I think they, they are a very powerful tool um, to help us uh, going forward. Um, with that, uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you, Michael. I think now we're going to go Tom. Thanks, Mike. Let me share my screen. Great. So, so my name is Tom August. I work at UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and I sort of want to give an honest appraisal of what it's been like using data labs from a, uh, an environmental scientist point of view. Don't have a computer science background, but myself and others in the group that I'm in have been using data labs for a year or a year and a half, maybe longer than that now. Time's gone a bit funny with the pandemic, hasn't it? Um, for an extended period of time, we've been using data labs. And this is kind of hopefully a bit of an honest appraisal of our experiences. Um, I've also noticed just as I was in the, in the waiting room that quite a lot of people from the group are actually in, in the call. So it'd be great if later on they can they can feed in as well their, their thoughts. Hopefully I haven't misrepresented anything in my slides. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background about our science, but I kind of want most of this to be more kind of generalizable uh, across sort of science domains, but I'll give you a little bit of background to what we're doing. And I'll talk a bit about the areas of our science where I think Data Labs has helped um, touch on a, on a few case studies. I won't go into a lot of detail. And then I'm going to close with some sort of pros and cons I see with using Data Labs. So first of all, um, within the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, um, myself and the others who, who have been adopting Data Labs work primarily within the Biological Record Centre. So we work with data collected by citizen scientists. Um, and this data is of species occurrences. So I saw this butterfly species on this day in this location. And we use this data for analyzing how these species and species groups are changing over time. And that's important for understanding the state of our environment. Um, we also, so we, we help with the collection of that data, developing mobile phone apps and databases for that data to live in. We analyze that data for um, assessing trends. And then and we also develop the tools and things for doing that, for, for doing the analyses and for disseminating the results. Um, so we, uh, one of the, the highlights of things that we produce are these uh, long-term indicators of biodiversity change. Um, so you might, often hear in the news about a certain group being in decline um, over the past sort of 40 years. Quite often that has either come through us directly or, or we've helped indirectly with curating the data that's gone into those sorts of analyses. Um, and these are really quite important for you know, hold, holding policymakers to account um, in terms of reversing some of the client declines that we've seen over recent decades. Um, so that's one type of output. Another type of output is um, creating tools for citizen scientists um, to collect these data. I thought about putting icons in for the various tools that we've created, and then I thought I will offend someone by not having their icon up there. So I didn't. I put in this generic uh, infographic about the Biological Record Center, but there's lots of smartphone apps and citizen science schemes that we um, either run or develop ourselves or have a, have a big role in developing. And you can find all of those if you Google the Biological Record Center. So in terms of our workflow, I don't think there's anything special about the way we do our work. Hopefully it's really generalizable to what a lot of people on this call kind of do day to day in the projects they work on or the projects that they manage. Okay, we have data. Um, our data is often in databases or in big, big CSV sort of files. We would typically have um, a local copy of this perhaps when we're when we're doing some analysis otherwise it might live on a on a shared folder somewhere in our institutional drives um, or, or we might call it directly from a database a kind of variable the outputs that we create data outputs data products might live again in these in all these different places 
we have code, uh, we're all R programmers, and we version control our code to better and worse degrees, um, but most of us use Git and, and GitHub. And in terms of tools, we um, we might share our code on GitHub for other people to use. Maybe maybe you will, if we have some time, we'll write some tutorials on how to use those. And we might develop our Shiny apps as well, which we would deploy on, on a CEH Shiny server. Um, our analyses of these species trends um, can be quite large. So we have variously run these on a local machine if it's a really small species group, uh, on a local cluster at CH in Wallingford, or on uh, Jasmine on the Lotus cluster that sits on Jasmine. That's actually where we tend to do most of our, our work now. So hopefully that kind of rings bells with a lot of people who are on the call. So we moved from doing all that on our local system to doing it primarily on data labs. There's always gonna be a bit of work that we do locally on our machines, but uh, most of the big stuff we're doing on data labs. So why did we do that? Um, well, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, desire to centralize, so getting all of our data and our code into one place, um, because in our group, there's a lot of people who work together um, at different times, and that changes over time. And so having consistency of, of access to code and data is really desirable. Um, to kind of force us to work together more closely, if we're sort of sharing these, um, these project spaces on data labs, sharing that kind of data storage, it brings us all closer together as a team. Makes things more reproducible because it's easier to get access for others within the team to get access to the data. Also makes it easier to share and open it up to others if you, as you've already seen from the previous two talks. Uh, makes things more shareable as, as they've discussed and for bringing in external collaborators. However, if I'm being honest, the main precipitation of the change was COVID. Okay, we all started working remotely and being able to have this central online place where we could go and work together um, really kind of um, made this happen a lot faster than we'd originally planned it to. So how does this work in terms of meeting those objectives? So in terms of centralization and working closer together, we now have all of our big data sets, both the ones that we use as inputs and our outputs, live on the object store, very large storage space that's accessible from uh, the data labs. Um, that's great because it's a much more formalized archive of our data than we had previously, uh, and it's got very large capacity. Everything that's on that is also accessible to all of our projects within data labs. Um, so that makes it kind of very easy to access for people on the team working on different projects. It's now our default storage place for all of our big data sets, um, both inputs and outputs. We'd also make it accessible to others who are in, in data labs if they wanted to access it. Um, we have projects, so you're seeing one project here on, on the right hand side, and this project has a whole bunch of different, um, uh, it's got our studio notebooks uh, in it. Um, and so we all work in that environment and, and we have some of these might be shared, some of them might be private for users. We do, we do a little bit um, in Jupyter Labs, but not so much because we're primarily um, our users familiar with our studio. We don't want to stray too far from our home turf. Um, and that works, that works well. Um, in terms of working with others, um, I see some real great strengths in, in things we've done. So what you can see here are the, the projects that I have access to. So Anna is a, a master's student who came and worked with us. And it was really great to be able to create this project um, for her. And we could set up the environment so it had everything she needed. She had access to the data, was there. And when she had problems, members of the team could just drop into that project, have a look at her workbook, and you know, and and, and you'd be you know, effectively working like on her computer, right? You can see the bugs she's having, and you can debug. So it's really useful for students, um, and so I recommend anyone who works with students to consider using it. Um, we use it with UK partners. So this notebook here on the Decide project, which actually funded through um, CDE. Uh, we have collaborators at Warwick University um, who work with data visualizations and they are members of this uh, project. And so they've come in, they've got their own notebooks and they're doing you know, visualizations on the data that we're creating from our notebooks. And it's a nice place to all kind of work together and, and share that data and it works, it works really well getting other people involved. 
um, and international partners. So this KFD project was working with uh, Indian collaborators um, and it was useful to have this sort of third party in a way kind of cloud space where they can meet with us and they can bring in their data and we can bring in our coding expertise and collaborate in this kind of open way where you know, they wanted to have eyes on everything that was happening with their data um, and so it was kind of an open way and they, they felt comfortable working in that sort of an environment. We produce shiny apps as I mentioned. Um, you can produce shiny apps in the projects that sit on top of the you know, sit alongside the code and the data. Uh, and that's great having everything in one place. Um, that Indian project I mentioned, and this is a, a, a screenshot from the app there, it's, it's showing you instance of this um, disease and a predictive map of where that disease is. And that was accessible to the stakeholders in India to come and look at because it's, um, you, know, you can expose it on the web uh, directly from the data lab so they can come and have a look at it. It also meant that our Indian collaborators could up, they could upload files directly into, into the app using this button, the ones who are less comfortable with using a kind of programmatic interface, although they had that available to them as well. And this is, uh, Simon Wolf uh, put this together, a really quick kind of demonstration uh, of, a, of a prototype tool which could be used as a part of the Decide project. Again, sitting on top of all of that data, so it's, it's displaying some big raster data here. It's all in that one place, we don't have to create copies of the data or anything like that. Um, and he was able to really rapidly kind of prototype this to get um, feedback from stakeholders. I'm also really excited that you could create in R, uh, using Plumber, you could create APIs um, there. Maybe that's kind of a niche application, but something that we're really interested in because we develop smartphone apps for some things. Not something I played about with, but it'd be cool to see uh, how that could be taken further. Um, right, so just the last couple of slides here. So kind of the green and pleasant hills in terms of what data labs can do. It's great for centralizing data, big data storage, sharing these working environments for collaborators within your organization, within the team. That's certainly where it's given us, you know, the most, I would say, but it also opens up you know, collaborations to others uh, across the UK and these national partners. You can have a shiny apps close to your data and close to your code. Uh, and it, I haven't touched on this, but it's obviously a big sell is the access to extra compute. And uh, the guys earlier talked about Dask and being able to create Dask and Spark clusters, um, which to be honest, we haven't really used very much um, because we do our big kind of processing on Lotus, um, but you can you know, get, get big chunks of memory from time to time as needed. Um, and so it kind of beef things up a little bit. Um, I'm going to end on the challenges. Maybe I should have ended on the green and pleasant hills, but I'm going to end on the challenges. Um, the first is, and I think is, I think people in my team probably agree, so not my team, in, in the group that I work in, um, is that there's a big cultural change. Um, moving to working on data labs is, means moving away from what you're comfortable with doing on your on your desktop and that can be quite a big hurdle for some people i would say for, at least for the r user community on the right hand side you can see my r studio console on the top as it is, appears on my desktop and my r studio console as it appears on data labs is basically the same so it's actually not don't be it's not too scary of a change but we do need to recognize that it is a bit of a cultural shift and that's going to take time to to have people comfortable with with making that move it can be a bit of a headache getting loads of data if you've got big data on and off. Um, now, obviously, once you've got everything on, you can do all your work there, and it might be quite rarely you actually need to take stuff off. But that can be a bit of a headache. And I think any way we can make that easier for people who are not tech savvy, you know, who aren't going to do stuff from Linux command line, um, is, would be great. And the other sort of main drawback for us is that we, because we use Lotus a lot for our big processing, it doesn't link seamlessly into data labs. So I can't like execute jobs and things directly from data labs, which would, would be the cherry on, on the cake. Um, instead, what I'll, I mean, what I should say is that Lotus can access the object store. So both these systems access the object store. So I can go to Lotus and I can draw down, my, I can you know, call my data from there, I could do my processing, big parallelization on Lotus, then I can save the data back up on the object store and then do any sort of downstream analysis I want to on data labs. So that system does work, it's just a bit clunky. So I guess overall, we've really enjoyed using data labs. Um, it's certainly, for me, I see it's the future sort of the way that, that we do, uh, I do our research and strongly encourage other people to, um, 
to consider it. And if anyone wants to have an informal chat about it, then I'm happy to do so um, uh, whenever needed. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and thanks to all the rest of the speakers as well. Um, <clears throat> Uh, please, if you have any open questions, please post them in the chat. I've got a few to go through to uh, start off with, but I just wanted to make a comment before we went into the questions. Um, primarily, the three presenters have been talking about data labs on Jasmine. Um, what we've done as a team, uh, the development team, is we've uh, decoupled uh, data labs from the underlying infrastructure. So actually, you could deploy data labs on any public cloud, like Amazon or Azure, et cetera, or you could de deploy it into your own infrastructure and it's all open source. I just wanted to make that statement to get that out of the way first. Uh, right, now I've got a lot of questions here. So uh, I'm going to pick up uh, one from Andy T, um, who asks, does reproducibility metadata, i.e. the versions of all the packages you use, the computation requirements, get captured neatly in some of the metadata? I uh, presume Andy T is talking about the package. Who wants to pick that one up, if anybody? Between Mike, Michael, and I can take a little. So, if you mean which, if you want to know, like in the digital environment, what packages are used and which versions, like like a thinner question. We're like I said, we use Conda environments. So, with a Conda environment, you do get an environment file that you can spit out. It is just a text file that tells you. The exact version of everything that was used but also with that you can instantiate that same environment elsewhere when you set up your own if you want to set that common environment up on a different platform or your local thing you could do that so it is sort of it's not strictly recorded in metadata per se it's recorded in that and on the other side with conda does deal with r as well but if you're a native r user like someone like tom we use there's a, something called packrat or R rm which also has an equivalent setup where it will record all the um version particular versions of the packages used on the computation requirements side of things that's a little bit more tricky because that would be required on the user to store the environment so it's run the analysis look at the um requirements used and then store it somewhere in either in a text file in git or plug it out at the end of the analysis i don't know if tom or michael want to expand on that that's certainly my experience of things uh, well i see uh, a, a no to that um okay so we'll move on to a question from carl watson at bgs uh, if i had a project proposal idea that included the use of data labs what is the process for investigating the feasibility and associated costs of this and perhaps securing a supporting statement from data labs for inclusion in the case for support? Does anybody want to pick that up or do I have to pick that up? Uh, I'll take silence as, oh, Michael. Well, you, you, you can pick it up. <laughs> I would say that, that the answer just contact us. And um, um yeah. it's related to another question uh, that came in um i'm just about um how do i access it how do i use it i mean data labs is free for NERC research so uh the costs of running data labs uh for NERC are zero basically um and that includes if that's a NERC led project and you've got partners that in, that is still uh, zero uh, in terms of the cost on the jasmine infrastructure because jasmine remember NERC pays for and we get for free uh, uh we've done and we've been involved with many many projects uh, that are project proposals that have gone in that include the use of data labs so we have lots of uh statements ready if you want to include it uh, in, in terms of the case for support so uh, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, yes and I guess add, add to the feasibility question. Yeah, yeah. feel free to schedule a chat with us and we can talk through what may work for you. <coughs> yes. Um, I've got so many questions. It's going to take me a while to go through these. Uh, another question from Andy T. Uh, sorry, another technical question. Uh, are project accounts linked to the use of resources? And can you set limits on how much computational resources use for a processing task and i think i'm going to have to pick that one up again to be honest um yeah i'll see smiles from the presenters um yes and no is the answer uh within within jasmine within where, where the data labs is <coughs> it sits within jasmine 
we get what's called a tenancy. And within that tenancy, we have a set of resources. And we can use those resources. Everybody within that tenancy can make use of those resources. We, because of the issues of people taking all the resources, we have implemented some software that, that lets the users monitor how much resources they are using and then release them. And that's, to be honest, all that we can do at the moment because the resource constraints are set by Jasmine, not by us within the tenant. I'm not sure whether that answers the question, but that's where we are at the moment. Of course, if you move to a um, public cloud like Amazon, then those resources are already uh, automatically um, limited depending on who the admin of uh, the tenancy is. But we can't do that currently within the Jasmine infrastructure. And there are lots of questions coming in now, so I'll go to the bottom. Uh, so another question from uh, Andy T. There's three, that's a lot of questions from Andy T. Um, do you find the computational resources sufficient for your current use cases? Are there things that you would like to be doing, but you currently can't because of data or processing constraints? What is more limited, data storage or data processing power? Does anybody want to pick that up? I mean, we touched on that in the last question, Tom. Yeah, just to say that I don't feel like we are limited by any of these resources. The object storage provides us plenty of storage space for, for our needs and having Lotus nearby, if not quite as close as I'd like, um, gives us all the processing power that we need for our sorts of studies. But then I know that, you know, big to one person is not, is not big to everyone. So um, it's big <clears> enough for certainly for what, for what we need to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I could again add to that. Um, Tom has pointed out in his presentation that we, one of the sticking points is access to Lotus directly from labs. We are working with the Jasmine team to break that barrier down. Um, it's more about security at this stage. Uh, and also in terms of uh, storage, the current object store that's available to labs is uh, 15 petabytes. So uh, it's quite um, a vast resource, to be honest. Uh, but if you just want block storage, we are more limited in that because that actually falls under the tenancy storage. Um, right. Sorry, I'm just whizzing through questions. Um, so uh, this is. Uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, lots of case studies and examples in UKCH, uh, but are there plans to make this more widely available to other research groups, or is it mainly a CH facility? Um, again, I should pick this up in terms of it. This is a NERC funded project, so it's open to all NERC funded researchers and your collaborators. Uh, the reason that it's very CH centric at the moment is because it's easy to pick on, pick on people within CH because I'm a, I am. I work for CH, and that's the only reason that it's not more wide. But there are currently approximately 40 projects on the data labs, uh, and they're not all CH. There's a cross section across NERC and, in, and um, lots of collaboration with the HEIs as well. I'm just checking the time. Oh, we've still got plenty of time. Uh, there is a question uh, in the chat from Tali Buck. Um, are the data available, I think, within I think, as I understand it, are the data available to anybody to access within the presentation uh, in order to inform their secondary-based data research? Uh, I, um, who wants to pick that up? So any, all the stuff that you've been showing today, are they available openly? Um, I think certainly the, the stuff I presented, so I, I was actually using ERA-5 data as my numerical model data. So that is available publicly anyway from um, the uh, ECMWF, and you can use API access to get that into the labs. So that's one option. Obviously, sometimes you may be working with restricted data sets um, for security reasons, health, if it's health data, for example, or got health and personal data in it. So some of the data might not be able to be made a open available, but some of it might be able to made in a condensed form. And there is a thing within CEH, sorry, within data labs, that you can mount certain assets so you can mount the sort of um sort of seeable version so to speak of the data to allow others to use it if you think it's a critical data set that might give some information in its um sort of a condensed form if that's one way but also like um we said if you've got api access to data and it's freely available elsewhere there's no reason why you can't make a version of that available to other projects within data labs through the um asset um 
tool or something like that. It's all basically on the licensing of your data, really, what you can and can't do with it. So hope that's that's one, one inside. I don't know if Michael or Tom has any further to add. Yeah, I guess just to, to add that for us, there's there's data that we want to share within a project and that sits within the project and isn't accessible to anyone outside the project. There's data we want to share across projects, which is in the object store and it's available across projects with access. Um, and then if we want to make data sets, we haven't wanted to make data sets externally accessible from the data lab, we would, I guess, traditionally publish those data sets. Um, but I know that there's a lot of flexibility within data labs for all sorts of different permissions, basically whatever you need. Okay, thanks, Tom. And Mike, uh, another question um, about data issues. Uh, one, can I upload, <coughs> excuse me, my own research data and share it with others? And two, can I access wider EDS data for my research <coughs> through, data, through the data store? Anybody want to pick that one up? Yes, of course you can upload um, any data you would like to your data store. Um, yeah, you can. You can basically you you decide who to share within the project, um, and um, yeah, and, and I guess the the idea of the devs is to to build this transparency. So maybe ultimately you want to um, share research output to others. But um, while you are working on it, yeah, you control um, entirely who you like to share the, the data with, and you and you are, and, and you can upload your own data to um, to to your data store. Um, so there are the main two main ways that you can upload your data. One is through a browser tool, um, the interactive um, um, data labs data store. Um, that that is a bit slow. It may not work for very large data. And there is also a command line to where you can um, move um, very large files. So, for example, uh, you want to move files from XPC to uh, the data store, you can do that, and it's it's very it's very fast. So, uh, just make a quick answer. Okay, uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, the the second part of the question is: Can I access wider um, environmental data services data for so data from the NERC data centers? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, it's probably easier to do so if there's an API to pull it in. Or you, like Michael said, you can upload it straight from. You can't upload it straight if there's not an API. You have to go and find it and then upload it. But it is available. Um, right. I think we're moving towards the end of the webinar. So I'm going to take a final question. I'm just checking the. There is another one, I can worry about this. So um, some great examples and case studies being presented. Is there a web page or something somewhere that gathers all these together, perhaps with some hints and tips on planning to use data labs? That's, a, that's actually a really good question. Uh, and it's, um, it's something we, we've kind of half done in a way. Um, the Charlotte uh, posted the data labs uh, link into uh, the chat. Um, once you have registered for labs, there are lots and lots of resources and documentation on how to get started. We spent an awful lot of time on doing that. Um, and here's a promotion uh, that Kate will be happy with. Uh, we are very soon due to launch an environmental data service brochure site. Uh, and on that, we will be advertising things like labs. So there'll be explanations on there about how to use it, which will then point you to the data labs uh, um, website itself. I get, which I said, there's lots of documentation and resources and things like Slack channels uh, for you to ask questions uh, amongst the current users. Uh, I don't, uh, that actually neatly takes us to 11.59. So we're nearly ending the webinar. Um, I don't have any further questions. So two things I'd like to, Thank you all for coming, but I'd really like to thank the presenters uh, for giving some fantastic presentations. And Steve will shoot me if I don't yet again promote, give a big plug to the next series for the construction of the digital environment. Series five is the data digitization, rescue and repurposing. And Steve assures me that there's five fantastic speakers gonna be part of that. So please subscribe 
and also subscribe to the YouTube channel. And thank you all very much for attending. Cheers.